Welcome to the Tax Cast from the Tax Justice Network. I'm Naomi Fowler. Coming up later in the Tax Cast, the millions of overseas workers sending remittances or money back home. It's a juicy 450 to 500 billion dollar a year market. We look at the cartel that's taxing the poor with monopoly prices. But before that, here's a roundup of this month's tax justice news. Facebook's back in the headlines. Turns out it paid only £4,327 in corporation tax in the UK last year. That's about $6,600. Many experts say Facebook's claims it's unprofitable aren't credible in one of its more mature markets. It's hard to know for sure, though, since Facebook's accounts are lacking in detail and transparency, as is their right. But it's interesting that their sales deals are concluded in Ireland. So, thanks very much. Much, Ireland. But we should never underestimate the power of negative publicity. Remember Starbucks? They were shamed for only reporting a taxable profit once in 15 years in the UK. Last year, it paid corporation tax for the first time since 2009. Iceland sent more bankers to jail for offences relating to the financial crash of 2008. The former heads of Iceland's three biggest banks... What a difference in approach compared to other countries. The main LuxLeaks whistleblower Antoine Deltour received the European Citizens' Prize this month for his actions in the public interest by exposing Luxembourg's secret tax deals with multinational corporations. Yet, at the same time, he's being hounded by the Luxembourg courts and faces jail and a huge fine. In the United States... Banks convicted of tax-related offences are supposed to lose their qualified asset manager status, but not Credit Suisse. A while back we reported on the tax cast about a special Department of Labour public hearing where many campaigners and experts argued for strong action against the bank. But this sanction's not been taken. Also in the States, Fortune 500 companies are holding $2.1 trillion offshore. Those are the latest figures according to Citizens for Tax Justice and the Public Interest Research Group. Finally, look out for next month's TaxCast where we'll be discussing the results of the latest movers and shakers on the Tax Justice Network's 2015 Financial Secrecy Index. Is your country on the list? We'll find out who's holding back transparency. Prepare for some surprises. Those are the TaxCast headlines. Now we're going to talk to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. OK, John, we've got some good news this month, so we'll start with that. The European Union Commission has now concluded, and this is a story that we've been following for a long time, that the cosy tax avoidance deals Fiat made with Luxembourg and Starbucks made with the Netherlands, which meant that in the Starbucks case they were able to declare minimal or zero taxable profits in the UK, for example, actually constitutes illegal state aid. There is a whole process where so-called comfort letters are uh, arranged between companies, multinational companies and governments, and I think that's something that you've had some experience of. Tell us about uh, how comfort letters work. Comfort letters have been issued by tax authorities and tax havens for a very, very long time. We're talking about decades. In fact, when I was working in Jersey as economic advisor, I was involved with negotiations where multinational companies were coming to Jersey and saying, we're going to set up a subsidiary here. That subsidiary will be used to book profits at a certain level. Can we negotiate a tax rate? And typically, in the case of Jersey, we were negotiating tax rates of between half of 1% to 2% max, and would issue a comfort letter on the basis they would be booking a certain amount, you know, maybe $100 million of profits would be booked in Jersey, and half of 1% would be taxed on those, those profits booked in Jersey. These comfort letters are very popular with multinational companies because once they've got them established, they can then start massively increasing the amounts of profits that they're booking in that country, knowing that they'll be taxed at a very, very low level. So this is common practice. So what the European Commission has, has done, they've been investigating these special agreements signed between multinational companies and tax authorities in countries like Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, 
and uh, they've now concluded that these comfort letters represent a harmful tax practice in that they are against EU competition rules. In most cases, these comfort letters provide a long-term agreement with the governments on how certain transactions, typically transactions like interest-bearing loans between subsidiaries of, of the multinational company, will be taxed. And let's be clear, the vast majority of these agreements, or comfort letters, relate to tax avoidance schemes. OK, I should, I should mention as well that this distorts competition. These things are not available to smaller companies and um, it's to the detriment of fellow member states within the European Union. Um, so um, how serious is this if you're uh, somebody that manages the accounts of uh, some of these large companies? This is a game changer. The European Commission regards these agreements as a form of subsidy which is provided exclusively to certain companies, almost always, in fact, always multinational companies, and they're therefore deemed to be unfair and an unlawful form of state aid which undermines competition within the European single market. Very likely that governments like Ireland and Luxembourg will challenge the uh, rulings in court and will seek to overturn the, the, the ruling. But the Commission has sent a really strong message now to the board of most multinational companies and to their tax advisers that this is something that um, goes against EU competition policy. We have to continue to call for these comfort letters, which are negotiated and issued under conditions of almost total secrecy. We want these rulings to be made public. No one would have known about the scale of this issue had it not been for the courage of the PricewaterhouseCoopers whistleblower Antoine Deltour, who revealed just the tip of the iceberg of uh, the scale of, of these comfort letters, these special agreements, when he blew the whistle on PwC's agreements in Luxembourg. If the European Commission is really serious about creating the so-called level playing field for competition between multinational companies and uh, smaller locally based rivals, it needs to require that all special agreements relating to multinational companies' operation across Europe are on public record and are shared between the relevant tax authorities. Yes, it's not the end of the road either because Starbucks is going to appeal this decision by the European Union Commission, so that'll be interesting. Let's move on to what's been going on with the latest proposals from the OECD, or as we like to call it, the Rich Country Club. They've come up with their latest proposals, uh, the BEPS project, which is base erosion and profit shifting, very sexily named. It's all about reforming the corporate global taxation system. So we've had the usual army of lobbyists and tax people uh, trying to get their oar in on this and influence every dot and T. And um, I wonder if you can start off by giving them a mark out of 10. <laughs> uh, um, look, We've got to begin by praising the ambition of the OECD team who took on a monstrous task in the face of huge corporate lobbying, massive government discord um, with different governments pushing for different things and very powerful governments like the United States pushing their corner and frankly not cooperating with the rest of the world. So at, at the level of effort, I, I think we must award the OECD team a strong B, even a B+. In terms of outcome, however, not such a good story to tell. I'm afraid the outcomes have been weak. For the last two years, this has been the big game in town. How far could the OECD take it? And the answer is actually because of the lobbying, because of the lack of political championing, um, they really haven't gone nearly as far as we might have hoped. That's sounding like uh, two out of ten, then. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe... Will BEPS actually fix the problems that have come to public light in recent years? The answer is almost certainly no in virtually every case. But I think the real problem the OECD faces is that they are still trying to hold the arm's length method together. And we have always argued that arm's length method cannot be patched up. It's not fit for the 21st century. We need to move on towards a, a unitary approach to taxation. The, the way in which multinational companies are currently treated is to treat them as a whole load of different companies set up in different parts of the world, not centrally controlled, which of course is not the reality at all. This means that the separate entities which trade 
amongst one another all the time with services and different uh, goods are supposed under the arm's length method to trade with the different subsidiaries as if they were completely separate companies trading at the world market price. TJN suggested right at the outset of the PEPs process that the OECD should now embrace a unitary approach to taxing multinational companies. In other words, go away from this fiction that they are hundreds of separate entities and accept that they are one single company and look increasingly to uh, treat them as a single unit and tax them accordingly, allowing for some kind of profit uh, split mechanism or move towards some kind of apportionment process. Okay, and so where are we now with country-by-country reporting then? Even on the country-by-country reporting standard, the progress made under BEPS is limited, partly because lobbyists have managed to impose an inexplicably high threshold, a threshold of $750 million turnover plus, below which companies will not have to report. Very nice. (laughs) Yeah, and just to make matters even worse... The information will not be made publicly available, which means that civil society, journalists, NGOs and so on will not be able to scrutinise multinational corporation behaviour. And as we all know, it hasn't been national tax authorities that have been challenging uh, uh, multinational companies here in this area. It's been civil society. So some progress, two steps forward, one step definitely backwards. Um, right, and so basically that kind of information will only be available to tax authorities from one tax authority to another. That's right, and will be shared through automatic information exchange pr- processes. Um, but even there, you know, we don't actually know the full story of how it will be shared in, in practice. What we can say about BEPS uh, with absolute certainty, I think, is that the rec- recommendations put before the finance ministers, which will go to the G20 summit next month, will add a great deal more complexity to already hard-to-apply transfer pricing rules, which will, of course, delight the big international tax planning people, uh, the companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers and Ernst & Young and so on, and in all probability the multinational companies will already be developing new strategies to get round the rules. Now, what is also clear is that the U.S. government, which has a Democrat White House facing a Republican-held Congress, will be very unlikely to agree on how to implement BEPS. And we can expect major delays, if not a total stalling, of any decisions in Washington. Some countries have already started to break ranks, applying different rules. For example, the United Kingdom has adopted the divided profits uh, tax, so-called Google tax. And Australia has now come up with a multinational company anti-avoidance rule. So we're seeing fragmentation here. So the overall conclusion I think we're forced to draw is that um, BEPS has not so far provided the range of solution required for the 21st century. And the danger we face now is that countries will react by picking whichever measures suits their domestic markets, and at the same time the race to the bottom pressures of tax competition will increase as governments use tax wars to subsidise investment. So, you know, this really is a very, very messy conclusion to what could have been very ambitious progress. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. The number of people who've crossed borders to live and work in a different country has hit 250 million. They're sending around $500 billion home every year. In many poor nations, these remittances are now by far the largest source of foreign exchange, dwarfing foreign aid, exports and foreign direct investment. This month... The Tatscast looks at the staggeringly huge remittance market and the remittance cartel that dominates it. This Somalian woman's husband sends her and their children $200 a month from Kenya. There is nothing to do here to earn a living, not even street cleaning. We don't know what to do. Everything you do in the city, every step you take, you need money. Many people in Somalia only rely on remittances from Kenya abroad. That's how we survive.
Nearly two-thirds of the population in Somalia have no job, and most people don't even have bank accounts. Somalians working abroad send in more money than aid and direct investment combined every year. In the Philippines, workers are sending $20 billion a year home to their families, who they often don't get to see for years. And even in Haiti, which received billions in foreign aid after at least 100,000 people were killed by the earthquake in 2010, remittances are still more important. Economist and Tax Justice Network senior advisor James Henry's been investigating. In Haiti's case, 2.2 million Haitians have moved to the United States or to other countries like Canada and are working outside the country. And their GDP is about three times that of the uh, Haitian domestic GDP. And so they're sending now between two and three billion dollars to Haiti every year, which is about 25 percent of GDP in Haiti. It is bigger for Haiti than all exports. It is bigger than all foreign aid. It is bigger than all taxes that the government collects by a factor of two. And so it is by far the most important source of development finance is poor people sending money to poor people voluntarily. Unfortunately, they get taxed effectively at at least 10 cents on the dollar by this cartel, which is composed of rich people like Western Union, MoneyGram, and its local elite banks in Haiti. So uh, that's the outrage. It's something the World Bank knows all about very well, does nothing about because it doesn't really want to rock the boat. It's something that the Haitian government knows all about, doesn't do anything about because it doesn't want to rock the boat. Okay, and you see that as a tax on the poor, right? Uh, Yesterday, a friend of mine talked to a cab driver in San Francisco who's Haitian. He sends money back to his family. He said, how much does it cost you to send the money back? He says, a hundred bucks is $13. And then when it gets to Haiti, it has to be paid out in dollars. Most merchants on the street take gourd, which is the local currency in Haiti. Uh, You have to go back to the exchange company and transfer it again. So there's another charge. So some people are paying as much as 20 bucks per hundred dollars to this private cartel. You know, that's the case in many countries around the planet. It varies from country to country, depending on how much competition there is in the local market. And it's kind of unconscionable for uh, these folks to be paying such a high profit margin to essentially Western banks and transfer agents. It's intriguing to me that The development assistance from wealthy countries to poor countries is dwarfed by the development assistance from poor people to poor countries by a factor of three. It's far more important than foreign aid. It's far more important than direct investment in these countries. And yet, you know, the remittance cartel doesn't get much attention from people who focus on development issues. Right, and we should point out as well that at least two and a half billion people don't have bank accounts, which is why they're so reliant on these kind of systems, which might seem a little old fashioned maybe in richer countries, but they are very necessary in a place like Haiti. And what you call the remittance cartel is making a pretty tidy profit out of all this, aren't they? So let's assume that they would pay the same fees that I would pay if I transferred money by my you know, bank accounts in the United States to Haiti, uh, it's on the order of 1%, maybe 1% to 2% at most. You know, they have to operate a distribution network. that has something like 800 cash distribution points in Haiti. And if you go to them, they're all sort of very simple organizations with lots of security guards. But, you know, they're basically uh, kind of a post office system, and there's not much technology involved. So I could see that maybe the cost in Haiti might be, you know, three to four percent, but it couldn't be more than that. So the profit margin is enormous, I think, on this fixed cost basis. You could have the government set price controls on remittances. That's a perfectly reasonable thing based on you know, what they estimate the cost should be. These are monopoly prices, and they could look at best practice around the world and say, you know, what is a competitive rate? But they don't do that kind of price regulation. And business is only set to get bigger and better for this remittance cartel, isn't it? Well, that's the thing. This dramatic expansion of migration, 
seen the Syria situation, several million refugees from Syria already recently, but overall the same phenomenon worldwide is now close to 500 million refugees uh, living outside their countries. And uh, the number is expected to increase dramatically. So th this problem of people sending money back uh, to their home countries is likely to continue and, and increase in importance. So it's nice work if you can get it. Companies like Western Union, MoneyGram and their partners have got enormous flows of money passing through their accounts and a near monopoly type control over the market. And it probably won't surprise you either to learn that Western Union is a prolific user of tax havens. According to a report last year by the Colorado Public Interest Research Group, it's got 46 subsidiaries in offshore tax havens and it's holding about $5 billion dollars offshore. Among the places it's got subsidiaries in, we've got Barbados, Bermuda, Hong Kong, Ireland, Luxembourg, Malta, Panama, Singapore and Switzerland. But what about Bitcoin and other digital currency platforms, other alternatives? These are still very small scale, right, Jim? So, I mean, last year, only 5% of remittances were digital transactions. So it is a long way off, even if the remittance cartel you're talking about would allow that space in the market to open up because it would challenge their domination of the market, right? Well, that's the thing. You know, you have to have uh, some countervailing institutions come into the market. that are really going to have enough clout to deal with the cartel's political power. I mean, then I guess anybody who is looking at Bitcoin as a serious alternative, they, they have taken this point of view that it's a technical issue. It's not a technical issue. It's a market power issue. The alternative platforms are, you know, kind of interesting to technology types and sort of nouveau internet people, but they're, first of all, very small scale. Bitcoin has got like $12 billion outstanding. I mean, worldwide, you're talking something like 1.8 trillion of big bills outstanding currency. So it's a tiny drop in the bucket. There's no regulation involved in Bitcoin. So apart from the security problems, which are kind of a daily issue, there's no central bank that's standing behind this stuff. There's no constraint on how much is issued or out there. It's kind of private money in a way. They've had an enormous number of security problems. And the prices have fluctuated substantially. I mean, it's unproven. It's, you know, the jury is out on whether it will ever take off. OK, and the Gates Foundation put a lot of money into trying to address this issue of the taxing of the poor, sending remittances back home to Haiti. It's an interesting example. Tell me what happened there. So, the, you know, the experiment that was run by the Gates Foundation in Haiti in 2010 was also sort of one of these technically driven strategies. Didn't talk to a single Haitian in developing the product. They just talked to the cell phone company. They spent like eight million dollars. Uh, Two million bucks went to the cell phone company. Uh, the IMF's IFC put up some money and then Gates put some money up. They spent about eight million dollars on this pilot of a electronic wallet on cell phones. And, um, you know, it ended up that they, at the end of the day, um, you know, poor people in Haiti, if they were happy to take the free phones and the $25 deposit on the phones, but then it figured out that they couldn't spend it. You know, that no merchants would take uh, e-wallet credits. And the people who developed all this fancy technology never figured on the fact that uh, seems like obvious to us, but uh, they had to be able to spend the money that they got. And so ultimately, Digicel, the cell phone company, had to go begging hat in hand to the remittance cartel, the six or so banks and Western Union and MoneyGram that operate the cartel there, to please give us cash in exchange for the e-wallet credits. So, you know, they ultimately had to go back to the remittance cartel and beg for the cash. You know, I think the Bitcoin problem would be the same. I mean, do merchants in Haiti routinely take Bitcoin? I don't think so. Do schools in Haiti take Bitcoin? No, not today. Not for a while. Many developing countries like Haiti, you know, 70% of the people have cell phones, even though only 20% of them have bank accounts. So 
this idea of having an e-wallet in principle is a good one as long as you can solve the opposition of the remittance cartel to allowing people to convert into cash. But, you know, there's enormous potential to provide banking for the poor services. It's just not something the World Bank really has ever wanted to tackle. Now here's someone who has a bank and wants to help the poor. The fight against poverty and hunger must be fought constantly on many fronts, especially in its course. It goes without saying that part of this great effort is the creation and distribution of wealth, an economy which seeks to be modern, inclusive, and sustainable. That's the Pope addressing Congress on his recent visit to the United States. He's often spoken about inequality, the responsibility of governments to address it, and he has the ear of the United Nations. So, Jim, you think the leader of such a huge and enormously wealthy organisation, the Catholic Church, could take the lead here and try to do more to try to tackle this area? I'm thinking the Catholic Church, the Vatican Bank, (laughs) in its quest for a new mission... You know, 90% of Haitians are Catholic. They have a lot of local churches there. They could easily set up uh, bank deposits for the schools in Haiti. You know, it's a trusted institution, and uh, they could send money from New York to, you know, church accounts for the schools in Haiti. There's something like 800 schools, many of which do not have bank accounts, and are forced to handle all this currency right now. We were there last year. They talked about several robberies where the schools were broken into, cash was stolen. They would love a system where they could get paid electric credits directly to their bank accounts. You know, I'm hopeful that the <laughs> we get somebody like the Catholic Church or maybe the Gates Foundation wants to do a, a new run at this. But it's very important to introduce some competition in this market. You say, Jim, that you've not given up on lobbying for a real challenge to the remittance cartel, but that you are looking elsewhere now. Uh, Lobbying these big multilateral institutions like the IMF or the World Bank. We've tried that, essentially, and it's very frustrating. They, They see their clients as the governments in these countries, and the governments, in turn, see their clients as the, you know, the private interests. I think it's more useful to kind of put together coalitions of other private interests. For example, the Catholic Church has some very wealthy, successful entrepreneurs and uh, business people in this country who would be outraged if they understood the surplus that's being extracted from the poorest workers in the world, I think. And, you know, bringing those people together, they have enormous skills. They could undoubtedly develop uh, any of the applications, and some of them probably have financial institutions, putting together coalitions of private business people who really understand business and understand, you know, that this shouldn't cost 10 cents. It should cost a nickel or maybe it should cost a penny. You know, that's, I guess, my own bias, having dealt with the multilaterals for so long, and seeing how political they are, the way remittances are being transferred right now, being priced. This is a clear example, not only of a poverty-creating institution, but an inequality-creating institution. It's transferring money from poor people to shareholders of Western Union, which I can't imagine is, is helping world inequality levels. The United Nations has just declared 17 new sustainable development goals and world governments have got 15 more years to achieve them. But banking for the poor and tackling this incredibly lucrative remittance market wasn't on their list of targets. You've been listening to The Tax Cast from the Tax Justice Network. You can read more about our work and our take on current events around the world on our daily blog on www.taxjustice.net. We'll be back next month. 